Let us pray. Guiding God, send your Holy Spirit upon the reading of your word, that it may serve to show us the path of life, and lead us into your presence where there is the fullness of joy. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 through 11. Listen to and for the word of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations, they shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, foreigners shall till your land and dress your vines, but you shall be called priests of the Lord, you shall be named ministers of our God, you shall enjoy the wealth of the nations, and in their riches you shall glory. Because their shame was double, and dishonor was proclaimed as their lot, Therefore they shall possess a double portion. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them the recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning again, and thank you. Our gospel lesson this morning comes to us again from the Gospel of John. We continue on uh, from last week uh, in John chapter 20, and we read this week from verse 19 through the end, verse 31. Hear now the word of the Lord. When it was evening on the first day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Peace 
be with you. And with those words, Jesus begins his post-resurrection ministry to his disciples. Peace be with you. It is a greeting that is used just five times in the New Testament. But it's more than a greeting, isn't it? It is a blessing. Once there was a time when it was common among Christians to greet one another with those very words, peace be with you, as both greeting and blessing. It's probably something that I would suspect should probably be resurrected among Christians today. Peace be with you. It makes perfect sense in the context of that day when Jesus spoke those words. In spite of Mary's news that Jesus was alive, they are shut up in the room, still fearing for what might happen, and rightly so. Now this has nothing to do with whether or not they believe Mary's word about Jesus being alive. Remember, it's the end of that first day of the resurrection. There were likely many stories of Jesus appearing to people being bantered about the community. There had to have been a great deal of confusion and still fear over what had happened. I mean, after all, if they, the disciples, those who believed in Jesus already as the Messiah, had heard these stories and were confused by them, imagine the reaction of their enemies. The people who thought that they had ended the threat of this Jesus of Nazareth once and for all must have been going crazy. They thought it was all over, and yet here it is again. They're hearing stories of a resurrected Jesus of Nazareth walking around and greeting people. They probably weren't sure the stories were true, but what they did know is that the stories were out there, and the stories had to be coming from somewhere, and just who do you think they were going to blame? Probably the very people locked up in that upper room for fear of the Jews. They knew that they were in danger. And for all we know, they may have been warned by someone that they should leave town or shut themselves up or hide or disappear or whatever was necessary. So let's not be too quick to accuse the people locked in that upper room of cowardice. Or even worse, let's not accuse them of lack of faith. At the worst, I contend there is still a lack of understanding about what Jesus had told them about rising from the dead. Remember, friends, the resurrection was new. No one had ever done it before. Yes, people had been brought back to life in Elijah's time. Yes, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. But this resurrection thing was completely different. They recognized that he was there, but not quite the same. He could appear and disappear. If they had heard the story of what happened in Emmaus, they noticed that they did not recognize him. And when he did speak to them, and they recognized he just disappeared. So let's be a little gracious. They must have been there gathering, wondering what to do next. And then, as he had been doing, it seems, all day, Jesus appears. The resurrected Jesus, this new creation, appearing right before them through a locked door. And yes, so it makes sense. Peace be with you. Be at peace, Jesus is saying. May you now have personal peace of mental and spiritual and emotional strength that comes with knowing that the good news of the resurrection is true. That yes, Jesus is alive again and that he has come to be with you. Again, let us not jump on the bandwagon of accusing Thomas of anything like doubt or non-belief, or anything like that. When Jesus appears to Thomas, he greets him in the same way, with the same words, peace be with you. Truly, this was for Thomas, as it was for the others, a greeting and a blessing. And they were going to need it. 
There was no accusation in his greeting of Thomas. In fact, he encourages Thomas to touch him as Thomas once proclaimed he needed. But Thomas believes just by seeing. The peace that Jesus offers is important and it is encouraging. But I would contend that the other two phrases used by Jesus in this text when he first greets the disciples, which are too often overlooked, are just as important, if not more so. When Jesus says, peace be with you, he follows that with the words, as the Father has sent me, so I sent you. And later he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Quite clearly, Jesus is beginning right here on the first day of the resurrection to give new orders to his disciples and indeed to us. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. It seems simple enough, but I'm sure with the disciples there must have been that question of, but how are you sending us? Where are you sending us? What should we do? Where do we go? Being sent by Jesus would mean a great many things to those disciples, not the least of which, for most of them, it would mean their own deaths at the hands of the enemies of the gospel. But in this case, I believe that the first and foremost calling is, indeed, to simply proclaim the good news of the resurrection. That Christ is alive, that death and sin have been conquered, and that in Him they can find forgiveness of sins. Jesus is, in this moment, giving the disciples the power to proclaim the forgiveness of sins. And that is crucially important. So often, in Jesus' own ministry, He was criticized for proclaiming the forgiveness of sins. Remember back to that scene with the paralyzed man whose friends lower him through the roof so that he might be healed by Jesus. First, seeing their faith, seeing their faith Jesus proclaims to the man who is paralyzed, your sins are forgiven. Then, when he is questioned by the scribes who witnessed the scenes and at, he's at, you know, about how can you forgive his sins, Jesus replies, which is easier, to forgive sins or to tell him to get up and walk? But so that all would know that he has the authority to forgive sins, he turns to the man and orders him to get up, take his bed, and walk. Now, friends, in the resurrection on this first day, on the evening of that first day, Jesus is turning that very ministry over to his disciples, giving them now the authority to forgive sin, to heal, and to proclaim the good news that Jesus came into the world proclaiming. And so that they may both know and have the power to do so, he breathes on them so that they may, as he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And here is the key to all things for His disciples as it is for us. Here they receive the Spirit from the resurrected Jesus. So often we find ourselves thinking that there is this somehow this lull in the action of the disciples. That the disciples simply just sit around doing nothing between Easter and Pentecost. And that only at Pentecost does the Holy Spirit appear. Yet it is clear already here in this text that Jesus is filling his disciples with the power of the Spirit to continue his work. And the work is much broader than just forgiving and healing and proclaiming the resurrection. Isaiah 61 is the prophecy of a day that will come when Israel is delivered and glorified. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus' first act of public ministry after his baptism came in his hometown of Nazareth. 
He stood up to read in the synagogue on the Sabbath, and there he took the scrolls and he read from the book of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And when Jesus finished the reading, he astonished everyone listening by saying that the scripture had been fulfilled in their hearing. Jesus was and is proclaiming for all of us to hear that the prophecy of Isaiah has in him been fulfilled. That the promise of the kingdom of God had indeed arrived and all the chains that bind humanity shall now be broken. Illness overcome, prisoners set free, the poor released from poverty, the oppressed given liberty. In Jesus, the once vague hope of the future has finally arrived. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. And just as it was the Spirit of the Lord upon Jesus to proclaim it, so now the Holy Spirit was falling upon His disciples to follow in His footsteps and do the same, just as it has fallen upon us. I always find in reading this text the great irony of it all. We have spent so many centuries calling Thomas, doubting Thomas, as though he doubts Jesus' words. And ironically, it is the much maligned Thomas here in this text who would travel to the furthest ends of the known world fulfilling this calling. Meeting his end in India, where he took the money of a king who paid him to build a house for himself. But rather than building the palace, Thomas gives it to the poor, causing his execution. Something that never left the minds of those people. So important was it that centuries later, as Europeans would travel to the east, to India, they would discover that there were Christian churches there who traced their lineage back to the time of Thomas. When Marco Polo made his way to China, he found that there was a Christian church there thriving amongst those who had heard the good word from Thomas and it had spread in Asia. Even today, in what was then Nineveh and now Mosul, the Christian church traces its lineage back to the work of Thomas the doubter, who traveled into those foreign lands and proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ, who forgave their sins, who healed their wounds, who gave to them that good news that we now take so for granted, and yet it had changed their lives. Friends, you knew this was coming. Neither the story nor the charge to take up Jesus' ministry ended with those first disciples. After the day of Pentecost, it had become clear that the Holy Spirit was imparted to everyone who stands as a disciple of Jesus Christ, and that includes you and me. Now it is we all of us gathered here, whether at home or in the sanctuary or anywhere else who proclaims the name of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It is on we that the Spirit has fallen. It is we who have been commanded to receive His Holy Spirit. It is we who are invited to come to His table in Holy Communion. It is we who claim to believe in the forgiveness of sins through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so it is we 
who are now being sent just as Jesus was sent. We are the blessed ones who have not seen and yet come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and who now have life in His name. Receive the Holy Spirit, my sisters and brothers. Receive the peace of Jesus Christ. And now go. Because Jesus is sending all of us out to proclaim His good news. It is we who must now go without doubt and without fear. No matter what the world may do or say. Receive the Holy Spirit. For you are being sent just as Christ was sent. Amen.